technologies that are helping to keep these birds alive. The California condor. Once on the brink of extinction, they are now on the brink of recovery. But it hasn't been an easy journey. 1924 was the last time a condor had been spotted in the wild in Arizona. After that, only a small stronghold of the birds remained on the California coast. By 1982, that population had dwindled to a total of only 22 birds. So in one of the first wildlife recovery programs ever attempted, all the birds were captured and a captive breeding program was begun. The breeding program was so successful that in 1992 in California and in 1996 in Arizona, condors were released back into the wild. Biologist Chris Parrish has been with the release program since the beginning. I, I didn't know what we were getting into. I didn't know that we would have birds extending as far out as Flaming Gorge, Wyoming, or as far south as uh, Lake Havasu City and Parker. I didn't think the birds would travel three or four hundred miles in a couple of days. Uh, I didn't think they'd travel 150, 200 miles in a day. Um, so I think that was probably most shocking. It seems as though the birds that, that had those huge flights uh, were early on. Now that we have uh, kind of a well-established wild population of adult-aged birds, breeding-aged birds, they pretty much develop their habitats and their territories, which, which it's only seasonally. Other than that, they're really, you know, very gregarious, very social, and they spend a lot of time together in groups. But the trips to Flaming Gorge, um, who knows what caused that initially, but were they looking for others of their species? Were they looking for suitable habitat? It seems now that they have their seasonal movements that are kind of constricted to uh, about a 70, 80 mile home range. So to see that established now and not to have those great trips away um, it, it also seems like they've kind of settled in. Door is open and the first bird is out. From that first Arizona release 10 years ago of only six birds, there are now 58 condors who make the red cliffs of northern Arizona their home. The goal is to eventually have 150 birds in each of the Arizona and California populations. 23. A dedicated group of biologists from the Paragon Fund, the Arizona Game and Fish Department, and other agencies care for these birds, and now they have a new facility to help. Basically, in, in the early years, we would uh, pull the birds and catch them. We'd have to load them up into a kennel and then drive them down to either Page, Flagstaff, or in the worst case scenario, down to Phoenix. So now, uh, with the increased numbers of birds, and the need to treat them now every year um, for lead exposure. Um, we have this barn now located immediately behind our field station that we've uh, equipped over the years with different things and most recently with the grant from Arizona Game and Fish we we're able to purchase an x-ray machine so that we can x-ray the birds on site and uh, determine whether or not they have fragments and then, what, then to the next step of what type of treatment. So basically we've cut out a lot of the uh, driving around, the extra stress on the birds um, uh, by being able to house them here. So we have the lab facility here where we're able to do um, uh, the testing and the x-rays and then we have a holding facility to hold the birds. If the birds are really sick and we need to keep them quiet or if like the most recent bird we had in here has a broken wing or something like that, we can keep them in isolation and uh, treat them there and keep them quiet until they're ready to be released or until it's determined by the vets on, on uh, staff with the Phoenix Zoo and the Raptor Research Center if they would like the birds to be transferred to them then we can do that. Lead toxicity has been the main nemesis of the condors in the Arizona reintroduction program. Twice a year the condors are trapped to have their blood tested for lead yeah, and biologists have seen over 200 instances of lead exposure in the birds since 1999. Although lead poisoning can come from a number of sources, the biologist's data seems to be pointing to lead ammunition used by hunters. Those bullet fragments remain in the animal carcasses that the condors scavenge on. So basically being able to lay out all of the potential steps and do testing throughout the year to determine where and when the lead is coming from to present this data to the hunters so that in confidence they can see these data and see that, uh, that we need their help. 
This x-ray of a deer carcass shows how the lead ammunition can fragment inside an animal, and it's the fragmentation that's the problem. Bullets made of other metals like solid copper don't behave that way. And it's not that copper is, is uh, not toxic. It, copper is known to be toxic, but the beauty of this bullet is that it doesn't fragment. And so if a bird is going to be exposed, it's very likely a bird being exposed, not a whole group of birds. The problem with condors specifically is that they're very social and gregarious. So they um, may feed in numbers of nine to 10 birds per carcass. So if the carcass actually is, is lead laden, then the birds are, are definitely uh, susceptible and can, can be poisoned in mass. Um, and when you have, as we do now, just 58 birds in the population, a good percentage of that population can be poisoned by a single event. In the fall of 2005, as part of an effort to reduce lead exposure in condors, the Arizona Game and Fish Department offered non-lead rifle ammunition to big game hunters within the condors range. The hunters responded, and thanks to their efforts, condor lead exposure rates declined by 40 percent from the previous year. The California condor is the largest flying land bird in North America. It can weigh anywhere from 16 to 26 pounds and have a wingspan of nine and a half feet. As Chris Parrish's daughters demonstrate, from here to here, that's a big bird. Condors are a long-lived species with low reproductive rates. They can live up to 60 years in the wild and they mate for life. Females lay only a single egg every other year. These birds are cavity nesting birds. They don't build a nest. Uh, they just utilize an existing nest cave uh, or a crevice or overhang, um, usually sandy floored. Uh, or, or pebble uh, floored caves. Um, so yeah, the, the caves that they've chosen thus far, um, one actually within the Grand Canyon was investigated and they actually found fossilized remains of condors uh, that were probably 10,000 years old. The Grand Canyon is still the best place for visitors to see these magnificent birds in the wild. And I tell everyone this from professionals and novice alike, um, if you want to come see condors, the best place to do it is probably the month of May at the Grand Canyon South Rim. Um, April, uh, you can come up to the Navajo Bridge area from the river from Lee's Ferry to uh, some of the drainages downriver from the bridge to uh, Badger Canyon, some of those places. You have, you have a chance to see them, but it, nothing is more consistent than the month of May at the South Rim of the Grand Canyon. In the new medical facility, there is a board where staffers remember the birds that have died. But even with so many odds against them, the California condor seems determined to survive. To me, what's most interesting about the resiliency of the species is that uh, the story of a few of these birds. The last bird was captured, AC-9, in 1987 on Easter Sunday and added to the existing captive population for captive breeding. That bird was in captivity for some 15 years and produced offspring that were later then reintroduced into the wild of Arizona and California. AC-8 and AC-9, um, as, I, as I understand it, were no longer producing in captivity, so they decided that it might be a, a nice experiment to release those birds back into the wild and maybe they would utilize some of their old historical haunts. In doing so, they might show the younger birds that are being released into the population that are parentless some of the areas and some of those old traditions of how the birds survived uh, before. So AC-8 and AC-9 then um, laid another egg and uh, everything looked like it was going to pick back right up where they would left off after 15 years in captivity. It wasn't too long ago that the idea of California condors flying free again over Arizona was just a dream. They are still one of the most endangered birds in the world, but dedicated biologists like Chris Parrish are beginning to see the rewards of their hard work. I think as a biologist in, in any field that we work in with any species, when you see the animals you're working with thriving and you see them reproducing and you just see them in this setting. I mean, we all, I guess we all had visions of what this would look like with condors in this, in this red rock habitat. And of course it seemed like it would be pretty spectacular, but um, to actually see them thriving um, and to see them produce their, their own offspring and to see their young and how they interact with the rest of the flock, 
uh, I'd, I'd say it's, it's most gratifying, as it is with any species, but especially with the condor, because uh, to have an all-time low of 22 individuals and to today have more than 58 uh, in the state of Arizona is, uh, I think that's approaching success. It won't be successful until we have a self-sustaining population, but for right now, we have a good start on it.